climb a tree. Watch out. Ah! Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Board Game Business Podcast. I'm your host, Richard New, and I'm here as always with Brian Hink and Jeremy Commander. Today we're going to be talking about how to run your own uh, board game design convention. And Jeremy, you've done this three times now. Uh, we just finished... Um, at the time we're recording this, probably it, by the time it comes up, probably about two months will pass since you've done uh, Protospiel San Jose. Yeah, yeah. So, what would you say would be? Um, how would you start? What, what would be the first thing you would do if you, if this is pie in the sky dream for you? What would you need to get in place in order to have your own convention? Well, I think I think if you want to do that in your area, you should start small first. So start with maybe a monthly meetup with game designers in a, a pizza parlor that has a lot of space, or a mom-and-pop restaurant, or a school, or whatever venue you can book. And kind of get your, your network of designers in your area built up, and players used to playing some prototypes, or at least I heard of that before, and I would probably start with, with that. So, you know, it's like we talked about building the crowd before you crowdfund, mm-hmm. same thing, before you you know, start a convention, you need to start small and, and build up. And that that's, uh, they're always really stressful for me. <laughs> And so, if you just start on a small scale and build up, it's a lot easier for you. Than you if you're get more to used to it. You, you're yeah. like that frog in the water that keeps boiling around <laughs> you. And you're not gonna, you know. <laughs> and, and you'll learn some valuable lessons to, to start out with about how you want to do things, how you want to structure things. I sort of want to reiterate a point that you just said. And uh, the mom and pop place, pick somewhere with nice food. And that's a trick I learned from the TCGJs. So if you go a little farther out of your area, so not, maybe not in the most convenient, you know, downtown, close place, close place, but a little, little further out of the area, and you can find uh, a place uh, where they have lots of table capacity, where they're not filled up all the time. And so you, if you, you're playing games on your tables, is going to hurt their business or, or cripple them. And if it's a mom and pop shop, they're not a big chain, they're going to appreciate your business and you try to have a positive relationship with it. You know, clean up after yourselves, be polite while you're there. And if you bring them regular business, because, you know, once a month you're running your game thing, they're going to like you and you're going like, to like them, and, and it's going to have a, a good, positive, mutually beneficial relationship. How long would you run one of those, One of, uh, uh, just a local game night before you start? I know you introduce a monthly prototype night in your game nights. Yes. Uh, how long was it before you started introducing, uh, introducing that, or did you do it right away? I have to look. I don't know the top of my head. It, it was probably... a at least a year, probably a year and a half, two okay. years, of kind of building up that momentum, building Make, up the crowd. So people are comfortable, we're going to come here, we're going to yeah. play games, we're going to, okay. And figuring out, for here in the Bay Area, the real, the real challenge is finding an affordable venue. Mm-hmm. So I either have to charge designers an enormous amount of money. So some of these prototype conventions I've gone to, I paid $250 for 12 hours of table time. Right, and and that that and, and that may be typical. And if you look at different events around the country, some of them are much more expensive. So them would be a hundred bucks, or different things, things like that. But a lot of designers don't want to pay that much up front. And so, is there a, a, a space you could get where the cost for the designer is not so outrageous? And so, like, could you get it to fifty bucks or thirty bucks or something like that, and then make it more affordable? Uh, and so that that was a big challenge here in the Bay Area. And then I found a location, that, a, a partner with a game store who rents me their space at a, a great price and is a fantastic partner, and they have lots of table capacity. And that's really what helped get it off the ground the first time. Well, and that, of, yeah, that, that, that worked really well because they had uh, they, so they have games you can buy. Yep. They're already bringing games, you know, gamers and in there. And that's one of the reasons they like you around. Yeah. You're bringing yes. in people yeah. who like games, yeah. and hopefully they get some sales out of it. And and you're you're bringing a bunch of gamers to their location who a lot of them have never been there before. So, like, mm-hmm. now they know of a cool game store that's kind of in their area, and they can stop right. by. And game stores are great locations because a lot of times they do have that sort of side room with yeah. the table set up because they want people to start congregating there. They want yep. things to, like that to happen. They usually have, like, so does that people can have right. and snacks so it's easy you know for you to to just grab those and you know the game store can make a little money they get the incidental yeah. sales or well, you, if you're going to do it in a game store the other thing you want to do is hopefully you have designers in your area who have a published game have a game that's out and so then as you're as you're building up for your design meetup or convention you say hey who has published games who has games that are out that you could sign and you can make that part of your advertising or your blurb for your game convention. Hey, come to this game convention and meet Brian and get your copy of Good Cop, Bad Cop signed. And this is good for the store because if people go and they don't own that game yet, they're more likely to buy it from the store. And if I give the store a heads up ahead of time, which, it, which I try to do too, about what designers are coming, the store will make sure they have those games in stock. And now they sell copies 
of that that people want to get signed or have the designer show them how to play, and it can lead to increased sales for that store. All right. And for the designers, too. Yeah. I imagine that would be helpful from your point of view. Yeah. Uh, so how did you find the designers in your area to come to, to say, hey, you know, we're yeah. going to have this, this, this prototype convention. Uh, yeah. Come, come participate. Like in a lot of other industries, they say it's not what you know, it's who you know. And your, your network within the board game design industry is very important because that's going to get you to more publishers who might look at your game or get serious consideration, and it's going to get you better feedback about your games. So uh, I would say that I started building my network and realizing the importance of that, and I started uh, met some people locally, and I started traveling to go to some of these events. And I actually went to one of these in Texas. I went to an unpub Proto Alley within a con, and I met two other designers there who were local in California, and I'm reading their badges because this is what city they're from. I'm like, hey, you're by me. You should come to my prototype night. And what I learned is now, now having run Proto Spiel three times out here on the West Coast, is there are tons of game designers in the area that I have never met or never heard of that come out of the woodwork for these things. Once mm -hmm. I put up a big one that's visible online and it gets some coverage, then suddenly I find more people. But I started small by finding people I know and then meet up. We've talked about meet up on the podcast before. Meet up's a great tool to find other gamers or game designers. I went to a bunch of meet up groups and met other people that way and started building some more momentum then. And then I did some research to figure out, you know, what game companies or game people that I interact with on Twitter or online are in my local area. That's how I met uh, Grant uh, for... Rodick. Rick Rodick Rick for... What's, what's his game company, Hyperbole though? Hyperbole Games. Hyperbole Games. So, Grant, uh, I met him on Twitter. And so he's he's one city over from me. He's not that far away. He's within driving distance. And then Grant introduced me to some more people, and it, it built from there. And so that was... Pulling in people from online, from Twitter I made, from other cons, from meetup groups, uh, from running something consistently, all pulling up for all those sources. And then once I, once I put something up that's like advertised or public, suddenly a whole bunch of people I've never heard of show up as well. I, and I bet one thing that you do too <clears throat> is that um, when, when you do hold an event like this, you kind of uh, fertilize a newer designer or help them grow yes, into absolutely. a more established designer so those who are just kind of dabbling in game design and they hear about, oh, a, 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 a convention all about, you know, where I can show people my game, um, then they'll, that'll, that'll encourage them to put the finishing touches on their prototype so it's ready for it. And, and those are probably some of the people that do kind of come out of the woodwork, I bet. What I want to do is our hobby is growing by 15, 20% a year, has been for several years. I want the hobby to be healthier. I want us to make more good games and to do a better job with the more people that are coming into games all the time. I, what I, my greatest fear is like the, the video game crash in the 80s, right, where too much junk was pumped out too fast and it soured people on that and it caused a crash. And I, I don't think that will happen in board games. So that's always a danger, especially if we pump out a lot of crummy games on Kickstarter. Uh, that's actually a good segue into talking about the players then. Uh, how do you make sure that the players feel comfortable going from a published game to an unpublished game? I mean, one of the ways, obviously, is to have the night every once in a while in your yeah. local play group where, okay, we're going to have designer night, and so these are going to be unpublished games. But even when you're starting that out, how do you convince people that that's just the night they're going to skip? Ah, I guess they're just doing that tonight. I don't need to go. You know, how do you get them interested and excited. I know in your game night, for instance, that's usually the uh, the one with the highest attendance. It is. The highest attendance. Rather than, like, you know, regular game night having the higher attendance, it's prototype night that gets the highest attendance and makes people excited. And so a part of that is to make the players feel like they're doing something important, to emphasize, hey, you, you're here to help make this game better. You like to play games, and now instead of just playing games to be social or fill the time, you're actually doing something productive. You're going to make better games into the world or make this game better. You're, you're playing with a purpose. And so trying to kind of instill that value would be the first thing. Uh, the second thing we, we want to do is to make it fun for them. So make sure that you're not giving them feedback on their feedback. You just, just, just take it and listen, write, take mm -hmm. notes. Don't, don't defend your game. Uh, Ask uh, negative leading questions like, well, what was wrong about this? Did you feel it was too slow over here? And if you ask those negative questions, uh, it will encourage people to give you more feedback. And the worst feedback you get from players is like, oh, yeah, it was fine. That's not useful yeah. at all. See? <laughs> uh, and then give them a reason to come. Besides the value of, of, of building better games, uh, in the case of our prototype night, we provide pizza. The game designers pull together, and they buy the pizza from the pizza place. And we donate some games. Brian's very good about donating games. Uh, and we raffle them off. 
So now you could win a game in the raffle, you get some free food, and you get to play games and do something productive. For Protospiel, I tried providing meals year two, and that was expensive and time consuming. So I won't do that, but I will keep doing snacks. So year one and year three, I did snacks, and I think so I have snacks for people to eat, munch on, so they don't have to feel like they have to, to leave to go get something if they're hungry. Uh, and we had raffle prizes, we got sponsors to help donate the raffle prizes and pay for them. Uh, and that, it's like, oh, you can win, win a game in the raffle, eat some snacks, and play some games, and do something productive. And that, that was all ways to draw those players in. And then, and then also you chose a location this time, this Protospiel, where it was close to places you could walk to eat. Like yes. A ton of places, yeah. rather than a place where you have to drive. Because once you get in your car and you drive somewhere, I don't know, it's, it's, it, I think it's less likely that they would come back to keep enjoying Protospiel. But if you're just walking somewhere, you just walk back and keep playing. If you're worried about food, the other thing you can do now is there's so many food delivery services like DoorDash and all those guys that will deliver to a public meeting space. They'll deliver you to your game store. They'll deliver to that the the church room you're renting out or the school cafeteria, that kind of thing. So you can say, well, hey, you can put that as part of your materials explaining your con. If you're hungry, you know, DoorDash in this area or the other food delivery service can deliver all these or restaurants Or even just restaurants that deliver. Yeah, or even restaurants yep. that deliver. Absolutely. Yeah, there's usually, like, let's say you're, you're in a game store or a school, there's usually a pizza place within range of delivery. All right, so Brian, why would a publisher go to an unpub protospiel event? Like, what's, what's valuable for their time? Uh, yeah, it depends, I think, on where you are as a publisher, too. Because now we have a lot of these, like, small indie publishers um, who are, you know, maybe doing mostly their own designs, um... But if you are at a point where you can publish someone else's design, then uh, then you it's a great place to just play dozens of games, as much time as you can put into it. I mean, especially at a big one like the Protospiel in San Jose, uh, it would have taken me two weeks to get to all the designers out there and play all of their games. you'd have to read all their rules you'd well, have, or watch your pod play video. You'd have to have them send you a copy of the game. You'd have to get players together. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, if I were to do it that way, then, yeah, I, I mean, it would take months to do that. <laughs> but you'd be but, able to go from table but, to table to table and then... Yeah, it was so efficient. I played so many games, but I, I only played just a small subset of them, too. I mean, it was incredible walking into to Game Castle and just seeing just a sea of tables, games, designers out there. There were so many. I mean, there were there were uh, probably a couple dozen tables of two two designers each, right? How many tables did you have? We had, we had just under 50 tables, 50 and tables. and I asked the designers each to share a table, and the, and the intent with that was to take turns with the whole table. Oh, that works so well. And yeah. so like, I, for like a four-hour block, your, your game's on the table. And then after the four-hour block, you take a break, go play some other designers' yes. games. Oh, build, your, build your network, build that community. Uh, and get feedback from other designers. Give them, give them feedback on their games, and then they'll, they'll come return the favor. And that was the intent. Some people didn't follow that, and like it was like little kids who like they yeah, divide the room in half. Yeah. They divided the table. This is your half. <laughs> this is my half. Right. We're both going to do that, and and that's really not what not what I'm hoping you would do because you really it's like I said, what, who you know is as important as what you know. You yeah. build your network, and but, to your benefit. I mean, talking about what you know as well is to your benefit to see what other people are doing, yeah, yeah, what yeah, they're yeah. doing right, what they're doing wrong. Maybe that helps your game out, and also I just gotta imagine it's gotta be nice to take that mental break. It and, is. Yeah. And yeah. After you know, trying to make sure everybody's playing the game correctly, and you know everything's explained well, to be able to just go, you know what, I'm just going to sit down and enjoy somebody else's work. Um, and you had 75 designers, wasn't it? You had about 75 designers. Yeah, yeah. So that so many games that I can just go play, see if they fit my line, and I can probably just kind of walk around and be like, hey, that looks like my style game. You know, and talk to them and jump in in the next game. And um, and then it's good for me to just kind of see what's coming next, too. Mm -hmm. What's the next generation of games coming out? Right, right. Um, and I can see what unique things people are doing. People are coming with some incredibly creative ideas. I think it also builds your brand as a publisher. The players see you there. Yeah. They, they, like, they, they may meet you. They may play your, one of your prototypes and like it. Yep. And say, oh, I want to check out the other games from this game company. And it establishes you in the community that you're engaging the community and you're giving back. Yep. And so that makes me much more likely to support you and support your future Kickstarters. Because, like, oh, Brian's doing a Kickstarter for Exposed. I met that guy at Protospiel. Mm -hmm. I, I'll back him. Yeah. And, and that you, you form that, that brand value, that reputation. Definitely. So, Richard, um, did you, um, you... You went to Protospiel. Yeah. Um, what did you like about it? Did you bring a game? Uh, I didn't bring a game this time. I have one that's sort of on the shelf and not there yet. You know, I mean, I think... I think that's sort of a. Uh, I wonder how many designers go to the thing and then uh, uh, 
look at how it, their game is being responded to and think, oh, wow, I should not have, I'm not ready for this yet. You know, like, um, I, I'd sort of be interested in seeing, like, a, um, uh, first-time attendees and seeing how, what they, yeah, yeah, yeah. what they would feel about the thing, because I know from past years, I've seen it happen two times already, and I just knew, looking at it, yeah, I'm not there yet. I'm not, uh, I'm not ready to put it on the table and have, you know, people look at it yet. I, I, I don't, I don't want designers to feel that you can go and your game isn't ready. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, if you did write things on cards and stuff, and that's oh, what that, your game yeah, looked yeah, yeah. like, but, but I mean... It doesn't have to have art, doesn't have to have anything like that. It's just, I, I'm not at a point where I played it at the local, uh, the local uh, uh, designer night, mm-hmm. and it's not fun yet. That's what, all. That's, what, what could someone who's running a convention do to make it more comfortable to someone who it might not feel like their game is ready. Is there anything they could do? My first thought was maybe like a separate section, but then the, then I don't know if people would want to go there. Now, they, how do you tear the prototypes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is like, oh, this is the, the children's section if you want to tell them. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily the best way to go about it. Plus, if you're sitting in that section, you're sort of like, mm, okay. maybe having more of a um, getting a group of designers together and all play each other. That's the way to do it. That's simple the simple game that they're not sure about yet. They don't want to uh, yeah. have uh, players play yeah. yet because they know there'll be too many problems. But go like, this is very conceptual, and this is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I know your design your design partner Franklin has come in with a couple times. Like I remember two years ago, uh, he came in with a card game that we just. You know, like, I designed this last night. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, Play yeah. See what happens, you yeah, know? Yeah. A proof and, of concept game. Yeah, it, completely like that. Um, so there's, you know, I have no problem playing one of those things, but I think I'd have a big problem coming in, you know, <laughs> paying for a table and then having, like, you know, I'd want something else, so, a solid entry first before I brought a secondary, you know. Okay. And if we have time, try this piece of junk. I brought three proof of concept games to protospiel this time with Franklin, mm-hmm. and, and all three of them bombed. They were, they were all <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Which is great feedback. Oh, yeah. Right. One went on the shelf, and two, two. there was just enough potential there that they went back into development to, to try get a second chance. Mm. Uh, and so that, that and, and we tried, I tried to play those either with other designers, which I did, or experienced playtesters like, like you, who have, you played one of them, that, yeah. that would, we really, really badly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I could see what worked. It didn't work, and you gave me some good feedback at the right. end about is you know is it worth continuing on that that path or not? Or are there any other lessons? I know you've talked about a couple already, but are there any other lessons that you feel like you learned after running Prospiel for your third time? I learn valuable lessons every year, and so I'll say so the quickie ones here is I'll provide hand sanitizer and cough drops next time. <laughs> uh, That's a good idea. Yeah, like that, that, those Especially are useful. The cough drops. Yes, yes. You forget. I, those those are requested, and then we'll we'll do that. Uh, I, I would say uh, every year I write some blog posts after the event and talk about the lessons I learned, and those all go up on the blog and board game builders. And so you can go back to the very beginning of the blog and see me run the first one, make a lot of mistakes, learn those lessons. I try to be very transparent about them and put them up as what I learned, what I would do next time. So if you're thinking about running one of these, feel free to go through the blog archive hmm. and pick up that, that feedback. You can avoid the same mistakes I did. And, you know, make, make your own new mistakes instead. Nice. Boardgamebuilders.com. Then, Boardgamebuilders.com. Right? Okay. You got it. I also put my, my budget up publicly so you can see what I spent and where all the money went and what it cost to, to pull it off. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I've been your host, Richard Noon. I'm here, as always, with Brian Hink and Jeremy Commander. And I'll see you across the table someday. Hey, this is Richard to remind you that you can check out our website at boardgame.business. Old episodes are indexed by subject to make finding an answer to your question easier. You can find links to our BGG Guild, other networking sites, and, if you feel like supporting us, our Patreon account. Donations are used for equipment to improve the presentation of our podcast. Thanks for watching or listening. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.